This rod lies between the hawks and the buzzards, which is a long tail, you can see very well there, long legs, powerful long wings, you'd permanently be hitting your wings on the branches, which wouldn't be good. So most of the forest dwelling birds have got short rounded wings and a long tail. And luckily for me, the highest hawk the temple. And just to give you how temperate you know how temperamental they are. I wonder if my staff are ever going to learn that you have to shut gates in the tent. But I will have one day, and then they'll be sorry, because what they'll do is let it out on the wettest day of the year, it will gallop around the field, it will leave holes that big, and then I'll make them fill them up on their day off. <laughs> and they'll regret it. What family they belong to, I'm afraid to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, is to look at the scientific name. And his scientific name is actually quite cool. The scientific name is Parabuteo unicyclus. Buteo is buzzard. Now you know the word para is what you have to <laughs> No me there, eh? Yeah, from here. And if you bang it on the head again once more, your name will be very unpopular. So like buzzard, and unicyclus is also quite clever, it means single band. Look at the tail. You'll see as he takes off, that'll be your cue, as he takes off, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk around the top half of the field and mop up my head. I'm going to cut your tongues back to nothing one of these days. <laughs> and I want you to watch him actually fly because you can identify birds by the way they flap their wings. So we know the hawks have a short rounded wing and a long tail, but what we're going to go here today, which we may well do, I think it's probably the same chap that counted the number of feathers on a swan. Would you like to know how many feathers are on a swan? Yeah. <laughs> I know. Can you imagine if somebody opened the door on a windy day halfway through? <laughs> There'd be bloody feathers everywhere. And what's more, 40% of those feathers are on its head. Oh, sorry, on its neck. A pair of talons, of course. And I will hand over to... I have no idea who's on next. But they'll be down. <laughs>
Now, just do a bit of geography testing here, ladies and gentlemen. He's also known as the Desert Eagle Owl, which he's beautifully coloured for. And he's known as Pharaoh's Eagle Owl. Which desert? Where was the Pharaoh? Good girl, the Sahara. So the Pharaohs were Egyptian, Egypt is North Africa, and North Africa is the Sahara. Well done. And we tend all of us to think that deserts are just sand. And somebody left a large piece of meat on there, didn't they? Yes, we're going to be in trouble. That's your beef, would you like this? Oh, okay, fine. So, he comes in the desert. And the reason that they have to be well camouflaged they say, oh, yeah, we really like toy owls. Toy owls, wonderful. And so your blue tits are fast asleep at night, sitting on their little branch with their head tucked under their wing, dreaming of tomorrow. And then all of a sudden they get clobbered by a mm. So camouflage is really important. Don't this one. Thank you. Uh, we have to... We have to let them go in the evening. If we let them go during the day, they have a miserable time. They get beaten up by crows and rooks and everything else. Or a pigeon. <laughs> we did once have a pygmy pork to get out. That got beaten up by blue tits. <laughs> you know, how embarrassing can you get? Now, you will notice, as Cole's eyes, I'm going to get him to go the long flight, watch how low he flies. And nearly all of the owls do fly low, because if you think about it, catching your food if you are using your hearing, goes to go all the way, as well as your eyesight, means that there's no point in flying way up there at the middle post, and you do a low one all the way. <laughs> so, he does a number of things when he flies very low. First of all, he can hear stuff close to the ground. Secondly, he's keeping a low profile because, again, we all forget that an awful lot so can see just as well as he can at night. So by staying low, they don't have a silhouette up against the sky. They have, of course, silent flight. But they also do something else. They create a cushion of air underneath their wings. If you want shots of them closely, you need to move back a bit. I don't know why they don't like tripods, but they none of them do. So, low flight, slow flight. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. The owl. Yes, you. Thank you. Yes, you. Yes, Matt, please jump to the fist. He's not very good at coming to the fist. And one of the reasons is that he also doesn't like to go into trees. And occasionally I've had people say, well, isn't he stupid the way he goes that he doesn't go into trees? And I say, well, actually, I hate to tell you this, but the stupid one is not him. There aren't any trees in the desert. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. I'll take them away, and again, I'll have a problem. Um, straight away, we know that this is a male kestrel. Now, kestrels display what we call sexual dimorphism, which basically means the boys and the girls um, look a little bit different. Um, so Thornton over here is a boy. We know he's a boy because he's got this gorgeous sort of bluey grey top to his head. Now if Thornton was a girl, we know in fact that he would actually have a sort of grey gingery brown colour to his head. So the boys and the girls look a little bit different. And also it's worth noting that, oh, going in and out there of the microphone, it's also worth noting that um, the boys are a little bit smaller, and we see this quite a lot in birds of prey um, for a variety of different reasons. But we're going to talk about the kestrel, of course, a very famous for its hovering flight, um, which is really quite easy. <laughs> there we go, but it that can hover. Now, there are many birds that can hover, but the kestrel is perhaps one of the most famous for doing so. Um, and like I say, one of the best sort of sights in the British countryside is, in fact, seeing those nests. There we go. There's a whole leg there. Um, we know the falcons are being obviously a very, very fast family of animals, but the kestrel, um, like I say, is much more adapted for that hovering flight. Now, what he does when he's hovering, he uses very, very specialised wings and tail feathers to fan his tail feathers and use the wind 
coming towards him with a little bit of extra added ump from his wings to sort of enable that sort of stationary sort of flight pattern that you see. It almost looks stationary. And the reason they're doing this is to hunt, of course. They'll stay stationary, or they'll hover above, they'll use this to stay stationary above a patch of grass where he looks for his food. Because he's very much an active hunter, is the castor. Our most sort of common bird of prey, um, we've actually seen them drop, um, and Zara have also caused another bird of prey, which perhaps wasn't so common, to in fact flourish. Now, they've got very different behaviours. You know, the, the buzzard is very well adapted to a scavenging lifestyle. Uh, it's very opportunistic. You can get food in a variety of different ways. To hunt is disappearing, which means they're just not coping as well in modern Britain, which is a real shame because it's absolutely fantastic to see our castors out in the wild. Uh, and to know their numbers are dropping is rather sad. But it's not all doom and gloom because, you know, you guys coming here today, uh, obviously are showing an interest in nature, showing an interest. We need more people to take an interest and ultimately we can find out more about them. Uh, we can sort of bind together as conservationists and try and preserve animals like the Eurasian kestrel. And hopefully we'll be seeing them for many, many. He's just part of the flying team at the minute. We've got another kestrel. And I can tell you for one thing, they are just the most fantastic characters. As we've seen one of the smaller members of the falcon family, uh, we're going to move on to Jemima, who's going to come down with one of the more sought-after birds here at the centre. And a falcon. You have to let go or you will never take off. You have my thumb. It's not me that's got you, it's you that's got me. Thank you. Uh, the problem peregrines have. Yes, well, hang on a minute. I just realized well, I haven't taken any dresses off. So I'm hoping so. You can't fly with those on, it's dangerous. Where is it anyway? Okay, now you can go. Now, this is a peregrine, and it's nearly always the species of bird that everyone wants to see fly. And I think it's probably because they're known as the fastest living. Okay, everybody nice and still. You can literally hear her as she goes past, can't you? Did you get a shot of that? <laughs> I told you she was fast. She doesn't hang about. Not 240 miles an hour, but she's probably coming in over your head to about 70. And interestingly, 70 miles an hour is how fast a pigeon can go flat out. <laughs> and if you watch a peregrine chase a pigeon here, and she does chase them, in level flight, she can't catch them. She's doing the same speed as the pigeon. She has to get above and stoop down, and that's when she gets the extra speed to catch either a pigeon or a grouse or whatever else it happens to be that she's after. They are now doing very well in the wild in this country. What made them rare, if you're as old as I am, you will remember a very nasty pesticide called DDT. And DDT was sprayed around the world with gay abandon until we realized it was killing all our peregrines, all our merlins, all of doing our Sparrowhawk's any good, and actually, it was poisoning us as well. In fact, most of you, if you're my age, probably will have traces of DDT in your body, but not enough to make you worry. And it only took the British government 20 years to ban it, eh? Impressive. <laughs> but since it's been banned, peregrines have recovered amazingly. And if you're interested, and now's the wrong time of year to do it, but if you, if you have a look on YouTube in March time, <laughs> I wouldn't go that way if I were you, pigeon. I would turn the other way rather quickly. <laughs> oh. uh, then you will find there's a whole load of mind heads, everybody. <laughs> uh, peregrine nests in towns and cities with CCTV cameras on them. Right, I'm going to let her catch it this time and you will see I have a slight problem with her stopping. Ho! Hey! So that's a promise. She knows I'm going to give it to her. Right, ladies 
You might notice that when he does take off, he takes off for the most part into the wind. I've just heard Tom shout on his way, I think. I've seen him spot but here behind the trees. He's gonna you keep your eyes peeled to the left here. Get that lift and get a little bit of height going into the wind. Glorious, you see he's hardly having to flap his wings there at all. Got a bit of sun, got the wind helping him out, pushing him right over behind the trees. So wobbly when he lands. You look very majestic, like the gymnast has stuck around you. You can't pull that. Oh, you hear that there? A round of applause. You really didn't work at all. Very good stuff for you. And again, like I said, you're going to notice that if I give him a signal, he might go without me. There you go. Oh, there he is. You can come in from that if you want. Well done. Uh, what makes a bird of prey a bird of prey is that it captures its food with its feet. It makes it living with its feet. So those are the four categories when we think of the four huge eagles. Now, Bambecula, being a stellar sea eagle, would fit into the category of heaviest eagles. So the stellar sea eagles are the heaviest. He's weighing right now about four and a half kilograms. But what's important to remember is that he's only just come out of his aviary from his malt. So he's only fairly recently joined the flying team. A couple of weeks now he's, he's been on the flying team. Uh, and he's also a male. So the females are the larger ones of the species. In fact, with most birds of prey, the females would be the ones who are larger. So him being a male, he's going to be on the smaller side. But also, like I said, he's only really started his flying season recently, and so it might take him a while to build that muscle back up. And he certainly has given it a good go, as you've seen from those first couple of circuits. With any luck, <coughs> excuse me, with any luck, we can get one more circuit out there. We're waiting for a little bit of a breeze. And like I was saying before, you would notice that you always like to take off into the direction of the breeze. So that's it. Face this way. I'm going to give him a bit of a, or let him catch his breath. You can see that he's a little bit tired there. He's looking like he might want to go. And now he's looking like, you mad. You're way too hot, you're way too tired for this. It would be nice to get one more out of him, just so we can end on a positive. And I won't ask him to do too much. But let's see if we can. Anyway, while he's still so majestically though, we can talk a little bit about stellar sea eagles. So these guys, you're not going to be seeing them. Oh, that's a good reason. Very nice too. Off, we've gone pretty wrong. For the most part, where you're going to be seeing them, is sort of north, uh, sorry, coastal northeastern Asia. So I'm thinking countries like that, they're not too hard, but they're nice and easy to hit a landing gear. Countries like Korea, Russia, China, and that sort of thing. So if you do see one around here in the UK, you're very, very fortunate to see it, but hopefully it's not wild. Anyway, like I said in the beginning, I'm not going to ask him to do too much because it is quite a warm day, and also Holly is ready to go with the next bird. So I think he's been a brilliant opener for you guys. I'm going to try and get him to hold on there for just a second because the idea is. I call him to I'm going to do a little bit of a training session now with a young bird who's only been here a few weeks, has been loaned to us um, by some friends. And the idea is that this is a peregrine. And. Yes! I'm oh, sorry, did you want to do the commentary? You do all speak peregrine, of course. <laughs> Nice. Um, if you were in the wild, come back. Listen, 
end of the field would have done nicely. Um, if she were in the wild, she would build it slowly and her parents would be helping her. So what they would do is encourage them to fledge and once they fledged, help them to hone their fine skills. And wild peregrines will often do things like they will catch a prey item for the youngsters once they're at this stage of life and they will drop it so the youngsters can practice stooping and practice chasing. So they build slowly in the wild and that's the same as what we're doing here, encouraging her bit by bit, day by day out in the field. Now what I'd like to do, if she'll let me, and if she's not too puffed from the first flight, is to give her a second short go, which allows her to build up a little good girl of fitness in the same way that if you were going to run a marathon, you wouldn't go out and do it tomorrow. You'd go to the gym, you'd get yourself dropping on the road and you'd build up bit by bit. So I'm going to ask her to do just one more short flight for you. If you can cope with that, if you don't mind enjoying a little bit more sunshine and seeing her. Now, peregrines here in the UK and in much of the rest of their range have had a pretty tough time at points. They're one of those birds that their population really has fluctuated massively um, depending on where they are in the Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold your horses, we're not there yet. Is it that you can see the food on the end of your beak when it's getting away? Shall we try that? There we go. <laughs> so, they really have fluctuated a huge amount in parts of their range, depending on where you are in the world. Some of the problems were caused by a pesticide called DDT, and that's something that had a massive effect on birds of prey because it built up in the ecosystem and in the food chain. Now luckily, we didn't realise that there was a problem that you're yes, seeing like you've got something stuck to your feet there, darling, and I can see it bothering you. Let me help you with it. <laughs> we'll wipe it on the post then. <laughs> I know, someone's going to take a photo and they'll put it on the internet and then you'll be embarrassed when you see it pop up. And so, <laughs> there we go, she's got it. <laughs> So it has had, the DDT had a massive effect um, on her. You can see what she's doing here as she flies along. She's basically flying with the brakes on as well as the accelerator. She fans that tail out because she's not quite confident yet. We are asking to go up there one more time. Very nice, a little bit of interwind, good girl. And I'm going to let her catch it this time. As I said, I just wanted to give her a quick short go to finish off. Oh, nice and nice. The wind's very good. Nancy landing on the top of the mound, how about that? They yeah, very good. It's hard work in this breeze, isn't it? So, having burns DDT, the peregrines, certainly here in the UK and in many other parts of their range, Europe and North America, places like that, they have made a spectacular recovery. And now we have um, an animal, called, well, a way of referring to them, which is the urban peregrine, um, where they've moved in to cliffs and what have you. Um, that are man-made, so high-rise buildings and things like that. I think they're fantastic. She's coming on beautifully, and what we like to do, as I said, is do some of the training in front of you guys, because we've come down here having done all the training without an audience. Often the birds look at you like that. So these are our yellow bill kites, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be flying up next year for you. Uh, and we've actually got five today. Like I say, we've got Heppel and Dingle, the two young lads. We've got Orense and Lombrisco, so the older ladies. And we've also got Tinto, who's a new addition today. It's his first day back out on the team, doing a little bit of flying, so anything can happen. Um, so it's going to be nice, we've got a nice bit of wind, the sun is nice, it's going to be the perfect sort of environment for our kites to do a little bit of flying. And straight away you'll notice that we're going to fly a little bit differently as our staff members have strolled out onto the field. They're going to be throwing up little bits of food for our kites to catch. And the reason we do this is because actually our kites in the wild uh, would catch insects on the wing. And what I mean by on the wing is, is that they catch the food as they're flying uh, with their feet and then pass it to their mouth all in one fell swoop. Uh, which is an absolutely fantastic feat of sort of dexterity in my opinion. So it's really fantastic to watch. Um, but the, the species I'm sure you'll be aware of, they're relative of the red kite. Here, the native kite to our country, the red kite, we've done a fantastic bit of conservation work as a nation to bring the red kite back. 
But these guys are actually from Africa. So they're an African species, and they're actually very successful. They're found in pretty much all the environments in Africa, except for the harsh desert conditions and the harsh sort of mountainous regions. Um, you'll find them pretty much everywhere. Uh, and although today we're throwing little bits of food to sort of um, simulate or replicate, sorry, that, that insect hunting behavior, um, they've actually got a really varied diet. And um, they'll actually get a lot of different food in a lot of different ways. And that's one of the reasons why the yellow bill kite is actually so successful. So like I say, they'll take your insects, they'll also take your small mammals from the floor, they'll take ducklings from the water, they'll take basking lizards, they'll take all sorts of food. And that's one of the things about the kites that really makes them so successful. They're really generalistic in their sort of feeding behavior, and they'll get it in a variety of different ways. But what we generally think of with the kites is that flying style. Um, and it's very much about sustainability. What, am I, what I mean by that is they're going to try and spend as little energy as possible to carry on flying and to get their food. That's why they're very happy to catch the food with their feet and pass it straight to their mouth because they don't have to land and take off again, which in itself takes quite a lot of energy. Um, and you'll see that perhaps even towards the end, they've got this fantastic snatching behavior. And what they do when they're taking lizards from the floor or taking mammals is they'll fly and they'll grab something with their feet and carry on flying with it. No rest whatsoever. So they really are fantastic, energetic um, birds to watch. But as I was saying, they're very well adapted to a variety of different environments. And that even includes our urban environments down in Africa. So what that means is that they are actually quite happy to live alongside humans uh, they will sort of, they're very happy to hunt around us and also to actually take food from our hands. Now, yellow kites are quite often described as parasitic kleptomaniacs. And that's a very showy off way of saying they like to steal food. If they were a human, they'd perhaps have the longest criminal record of them all. These guys are fantastic thieves. And what's been noted is their ability to snatch our hamburgers and our hot dogs straight from our hands as we're having our barbecues. And what's really remarkable is that the way they swoop through the smoke. They see the smoke and they know it's a sign for food. So barbecues are the perfect time to grab some hot dogs and burgers from our yellow bill kite. So what's really interesting is to try and understand why they have this affinity and lack of fear of smoke and of fire. And that's because in the wild, yellow bill kites have been recorded when they're all wildfires big raging grass fires stretching across the land, the kites will come towards it, use, uh, use the smoke, what's that, sorry? Okay, um, they will use the smoke to swoop through and actually grab insects and other animals, <laughs> other than brisket, we come for a little bit of a, bit of a sit, uh, they'll actually swoop through the smoke and take the insects and take stuff that is retreating. So if you guys just take a step back from the barrier, please, because the birds might land on there. So we'll take to use the smoke to get food. That's why they come back for the barbecues. So I think it's absolutely fascinating. So I hope you enjoyed that, guys. That was a really good demo. I think they all did well. Even our sort of our new addition. There we go, Lumbrista. Uh, so a big round of applause for Tinto. First flight back of the season. Uh, back on the season. I hope you enjoyed it. We're going to hand you over to Jemima, who's going to tell you all about her next bird. Thank you. I wonder if I can turn this young thing on. Yes, I can. <laughs> Probably running after her. <laughs> right, ladies and gentlemen, we moved from the kites, and it was lovely to see five of them going, to something much smaller and full of character that comes down in his own taxi. And I'm afraid all children need to be sitting down for this one. You don't have an option because I want to bring him up to the front and he is very small and so if you rush up to him I'm afraid the rules are I have to feed you to the front door. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's such a shame, isn't it? But don't worry, it's a relatively painless step, a bit slow, but... Mm -hmm. Now you can see why. They've all gone to Herefordshire. Get down the hole. At the moment we have we're on solid clay here, and quite frankly, he'd probably need a JCB to dig a hole in it. Get down hot. But as you can see, back on your seat, you. Well <laughs> three. One, two, three, four. He knows he's got to stay there for a count of three. 
I think he's in camp, actually. Either daylight or dark. But the but not that one. All right, go through that one and then come around here. And through that one. And back down the other way. Good boy. Well done. Now, unfortunately, he's not. I can't get him to do that over here. He'll do this tunnel fine. I've been trying a whole year to get him down that one. He refuses point blank. Where are you anyway? Come over here. Oh, ha ha. Very clever. Come over here. I won't ask you to go over down that one. You can go down this one. Years ago. And a rabbit was in there. And a rabbit chased him out. And he's never really forgotten. Unfortunately, the rabbit actually had babies in there. Which is why I chased him out. And on Easter Monday, they were up. And all the staff go, please God, don't let somebody eat the Easter bunny. <laughs> now these have prairie dogs, which here in North America, have built huge, what are called, is not popular. Because what it be like is with rattlesnakes. And people don't like snakes. And a friend of mine made a very good film years ago in South Asia. And he was filming where the people living there, the locals, were catching literally every snake they could off the shelf of the rat population multiplied. Why did the rat population multiply? They killed all the snakes. So we had these are obviously much more popular in terms of being a lodger, and they actually do pay rent. Don't you dare trip me up. <laughs> Down the, you're not going back yet. Down the hall once more. Excuse me. Thank you. <laughs> Gorgeous. It's closed. You can't get in. Oh, no. What they do is the burrowing owls have a very loud alarm call, and if they see a predator, they will yell their little heads off. The prairie dogs also have a very loud alarm call, and if they yell, all the prairie dogs go down the hole. But the clever bit about it is they both make the same noise for the alarm call. So whoever does it first, everybody is warned and everybody goes down the hole. All right, you can go back in your box now. Are you ready? When your marks get set up. <laughs> Give him a line with you. Right, you have to look healthy for the next two. They're going to come down from behind you. Yeah, I know where he is. So, ladies and gentlemen, here at ICBP, we are big fans. For instance, our demo, we're hoping that you too will be a big fan of our hooded waters too. Because as a group of birds, waters are perhaps some of the most endangered on the planet. Uh, hooded vultures in particular are what we call critically endangered. That means that they're very close to being completely extinct in the wild, which would be a huge shame, let me tell you. So, like I say, during this demonstration, we hope by the end of it you're going to fall in love with our vultures, and you too will see what fantastic, charming characters they in fact are. Because over the years, our vultures are being seen in Disney films as horrible, uh, pestilent, sort of stupid animals, um, or perhaps through the sort of history of time often being associated with death. Now really guys, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, perhaps I'm a little bit biased as I've worked with these guys, but I can tell you they're charming, intelligent, and very clean creatures. But what's really, really important from this demonstration is for you guys to understand how much we need to conserve and save our vultures. Um, because they really are in a lot of trouble. Like I say, these guys are critically endangered. This species, the hooded vulture. Um, so this is an African. One of the threats is, in fact, um, what we call a belief-based medicine. Now, belief-based medicine is a sort of a type of medicine that isn't necessarily grounded in any scientific fact, any scientific papers, any scientific literature. It's just something that's evolved through culture. And the thought is, basically, that if you were to smoke the brains of Salem and Batuli of their environments, they know when they're going to find some food. But people haven't always understood how they're able to find their food, their food with such... such. Uh, but these guys, they're what we call a sentinel species, like I just described. They know their environment. They're not going 
see up there today, you can see a bit of a side slip there as he goes over the top of the trees. And we do have to be a little bit careful about the conditions to make sure that we're happy. So Adam, are you happy? Okay, so once the crow is up, I'm going to unhood Cully, who has been doing this for about two years. That's a very brave pigeon, isn't it? Um, look, there's a rope over there, never mind the tractor, and there's the pigeon. Um, he is equally fair game, but probably faster than the rope pro. Okay, off the fist. The first thing that...
won't worry about the tree for today. Um, I'll try and read down this front as well. So, the hawk owls have that bright yellow eye, like the sparrowhawks do. You've also got the lovely bar, the longest tummy, a little bit like the sparrowhawks. Um, and then you've got the ability, the shape that he is, gives him the ability. Can you come in over here? Just know there's a crow wandering up behind me. <laughs> um, gives him the ability to catch birds on the wing. And that's not something you see from many of the owl species. They are a little bit more inclined to and want to uh, cat prey down on the ground. Are you coming? This is our wood, but there's a sneaky crow. You're not sure about the crows today, are you? Well, what's that now? Aeroplane. Oh, it's all going hideously wrong, isn't it? Let's go over here and uh, let's go. Nice. One more short one to finish off. How about that? And we do have. Uh, are you coming? How about this one? This is the easiest flight you'll be all day. There we go. We do have a golden rule here at the International Centre for Birds of Prey. Folks, the mask is to quit while you're still ahead. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, if I've still got my bird within reaching distance, that means I'm ahead. So I'm going to stop there. He's obviously a little bit uneasy today with the aerial things going on, the aeroplanes and the crows and what have you. But do you know what? That's absolutely fine. He's a youngster. He's only three months old. He's still learning. And it's all about making sure that he's confident as well as sharing him to you guys. So thank you very much for listening to me. I'm going to hand over to Pippa. He does have a hood on. It's where the term hoodwinked came from. I've picked up the dodgy microphone. There we go, we're on. Okay, so we are going to the Falcon family now. You've got a little bit of a Falcon teaser in a sense. Um, just before this demonstration with Joel Fine Corsair and he was a lurker falcon and here for you we have got Updraft and he is a Saker. He's again five years old so same age as Stratosphere um, and this is a species that unfortunately is endangered. They're behind the trees! <laughs> there he comes. Here at the centre and weren't breeding from. There we go. <laughs> it is incredibly hard to keep eyes on them. I only just managed to keep it when he hit 300. So not bad for a day like today. I wasn't thinking he was going to find me like that. So I will take him away and I'm going to hand you back over to Holly again. He's going to fly another owl for you. Somebody a little bit more experienced. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. At least we saw it. Demonstrated beautifully. Um, the sort of big broad wing shape, uh, relatively sort of short but nice fan shaped tail, uh, big feet, big, um, and a nice powerful beak to go with it. Um, having told you all of those things, though, Muggy's actually representing the smallest of the eagle owl uh, family. But everybody else in his family group is even bigger than him. So, um, thorny owls that we have here in the UK on their kid lads, um, very nice. And he is certainly um, sort of more robust as well. Now, as you can see, being a little bit more experienced, um, bless him, he's not so worried about the crows, he's not so worried about the aeroplanes coming over, and that will come in time. Over here, that would be good. Um, now, being an Abyssinian, he'd be in a sort of woody or semi woody habitat. Generally, looking to hunt things down on the ground. So very much um, a yes, very good, very much a perch and pounce hunter, like many of the owls. What they like to do is get themselves a good vantage point, find themselves somewhere that is worth having a look out and being able to sort of watch the world go by. And then when they see something that's worth chasing, maybe a rat or a vole or a small mammal down the ground, something like that, they will do a short burst of stealth flight to make the most of trying to catch that prey. A long way off. Oh, my head. Here we go. I promise you he'd come close, didn't I? <laughs> there you go, buddy. Um, one of the things I do like to talk about with him, in particular, is camouflage. Because we talk a lot about the adaptations that the owls have that give them their stealth, being able to fly silently. So as he comes over your head, he barely makes a breath of noise. You don't know when he's sneaking up on you, do you? Um, but you've got this sort of, you know, he's got good hearing, he's got very good eyesight, all of the things that help him to hunt. But it's very important to the owls. One of the other things 
that he's so good at, and that Titan and the little hawk owl is still learning and um, being confident about. It's these nice long flights. I'm going to do him just one flight down to the back and back up to the front. Because the other thing that is so important to the owls is being able to do this silent glide. And if you watch him as he comes along this big expanse across the field here, what he tends to do, very nice, you beat me to it, buddy. Here you go, you have that one there. Now eat that and give a girl a chance to get back to the front. <laughs> so what he tends to do, if he can get away with it, is he puts in a few powerful wing beats at the start when he drops off that perch, he comes down nice and low, and then he maintains that low glide without having to beat his wings again. I think he's wonderful. He thinks he's a bit wonderful as well. Um, I'm convinced. Um, so we'll ask him to go in the tree one more time, um, and then I think he deserves a huge round of applause. Because he really is fabulous, aren't you? Yes, you and Chatty. Are you ready? Incidentally, he doesn't like the yellow Labrador either. Uh, excuse me. They've been used to the black Labradors for so long that when we ended up with a yellow one in the mix, all of the birds have gone, holy oh, smokes, you're a bit different. Now, there we go, my geeky boy. In our hearts, because he was actually the very first one that we bred here back in 2014. And so he's another weather and weather conditions, baby. Um, and what makes his story even more special is the fact that his parents actually came to us in about 2002 and they were confiscated from Heathrow Airport as somebody was trying to smuggle them into the country in tiny plastic tubes in their suitcase. Which is absolutely insane, quite frankly, I think. Um, now, he hunts, as you can see, in a variety of ways. And I apologise that I'm over here using this pond. I'm not in front of you guys over there. That one had a leak, so we're having to sort it out before we can reuse that pond um, and so he will catch food in the air he will snatch food off the floor and he is also perfectly capable of snatching food off the pond and this is basically mimicking how they would hunt fish out in the wild so if you were here for the two o'clock demonstration you would have seen Ben Beckula, our stellar sea eagle flying and he would hunt his fish in a very similar way as well by snatching it from just underneath the surface of the water could fall and, and the bold eagle and you will see that they have a very similar colour or pattern in a sense as to zephyr they all have a patch of white on them somewhere with zephyr it's a lovely white head and fib and that is basically there to break up his outline so that when he's fishing if the fish see a classic bird shape, they will dive down deeper because that is a threat to them. Whereas if you have that patch of white, you missed it. <laughs> you missed it again. On them, some means that they don't look like that classic bird shape, and therefore the fish don't dive down deeper, and therefore they stand the chance of catching it successfully by just snatching it from underneath the surface of the water. But one thing I do love about them is juveniles look completely different and they've been seen almost practicing their skills with leaves. Fly up into the air with it and then they'll drop it as they're flying and come back down to catch it as it's falling. And that really is just a way of being able to home in and practice your skills when you might still have the help of mum and dad. Right, so the challenging thing with Zephyr is getting him back in at the end. We actually flew his dad for a bit before we popped them in for breeding, or hopefully breeding, um, and his dad was exactly the same. Had to check the whole field to make sure there were no bits left, and then try and just get as much out of the glove as possible. Don't you, hey? Would you like to come in? Yes. So we have the task of getting him to come back in whilst he's having way too much fun checking for all the bits that have potentially been dropped throughout the day. And we had his mum, as I said, we've got his parents here still, they're in our aviaries. They've actually got one of their um, offspring next door with their new partner to hopefully provide a breeding pair for the future. And Zephyr being the very first one that we successfully hatched, we actually hand reared him 
and artificially incubated. Um, his egg gave his parents a dummy egg career and then a foster chick career, and they did a fantastic job. Cut every single bit off the field, which means that the only bit is left to here. You are having way too much fun, so what we will do is give them a little bit to catch, to focus him back on me. There we go, then. Come on, you little scamp. <laughs> yes, you. It's here. <laughs> you always. There we go. Good boy. Just has to triple check. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed him. Hand over to my now 22 years old and was bred at Bristol. So I'll probably be uplisted to critically endangered. And I don't know if you know it, but critically endangered actually means there is a 50% extremely badly, and I agree thoroughly with David Attenborough, who said that human beings are a plague. Because with what we know right now, we should not be losing species. It's not good. Now, we have been working in India since the year 2000, and that is because the vultures in India have had a 99.9% .9 population crash over only about 20 years. It took four years to discover what the problem was, and it turned out to be quite extraordinary. It was a drug called diclofenac, which is a non-steroid anti-inflammatory drug, which in the late 80s was licensed as a veterinary drug in South Asia, South America, and Africa. And in India, two and a half million doses were given to cattle every year. Unfortunately, if the cows died while still on the drug, then vultures came along and ate it, the vultures were dead in about 36 hours. And a very painful and unpleasant death as well, it was a renal failure, and most of their organs had crystallised. You may remember, nature abhors duck, well done, is being filled by feral dogs. The feral dog population in India now has reached 20, the top in the world for humans dying in rabies. In human terms, but in medical terms, it is billions of dollars every year. So it just goes to show how incredibly important vultures really are. Uh, and you might wonder why we're there, and the reason is that this place leads the world in the captive breeding of birds of prey. We have bred 71 species to date. I was very proud of when we bred our 70th this year in my 70th year. Go chase the crow, go on. And because of what we know about captive breeding, we get asked to hold in India and Nepal and design the conservation breeding program, train the staff how to look after the birds, train them how to use artificial incubation, how to rear the young, how to put the young back with the parents, all the sorts of things that are involved in a conservation breeding program. And last year, I'm also very proud to say that we were there, I was there for the first ever world first ever release of oriental white rump vultures captive bred in the pool back to the wild and that was very special now we're not likely to ever get up to the numbers that we used to be at because uh, india is now cleaning up a lot of the carcasses very sensibly you can't just leave them there now the vultures are gone and so there won't be the sort of food available she's got he we find I tend to call it a she, that's been for 15 years. He thought it was female. But it's not just male. Not that it really matters, because it doesn't want to breed anyway. And they have a bare face. Bare face, long nose. Some people don't think they're very pretty. But they are incredibly important to this. Was they protected them, and consequently, they became extremely common in Egypt. And they ended up being called Pharaoh's chicken. Which you have to admit, when you watch him walk, is a pretty good name. It's very difficult to be serious when he's doing that. Did you want to go through the gate? You don't like going through the gate. You don't like the gate. You want me to open the gate for you. Very good. Well done. Are you going home on your own? Or do you want me to come with you? I'm coming up to you.